get to the bottom of this, let us say, the... Uh, so essentially, I will try to argue that uh, basically we live in a nonlinear world, and since we live in a nonlinear world which supports generation of self-organization, which supports generation of uh, self-generation of complex structures, linear mathematics, linear physics on which quantum mechanics is based cannot by definition produce these things. So basically entanglement, as I will try to argue, is only a linear manifestation. I'm not using the word approximation. It's a linear manifestation of complex structures. And complex structures are based on chaos, which is entirely nonlinear, extreme nonlinearity. It is based on complexity, which is, again, evolution. It is uh, self-organization. It is the emergence of properties which come on their own. Now, basically, the point to remember is that none of these characteristics can come through linear mathematics. And therefore, uh, let us say that this theory is basically anti Well, let us look at some of the what uh, our peers have to say. According to Stephen Hawking in 2000, essentially he believes that this present century will be a century of complexity. Then uh, we have a Nobel laureate, <coughs> David Ross. He was one of the founders of string theory. Now, what does he say? What he has to say is that uh, the present state of physics is like uh, when it was when people first discovered radioactivity. They had missed something very vital. What we are doing right now is that we are missing something equally vital. What it is, we have no idea. Finally, Lee Smollett, who is the most outspoken critic of string theory and is essentially one of the basic founders of the Perimeter Institute, which, whose basic job is to investigate these, uh, uh, these matters to its foundational aspect, says, uh, the last one in a book which I would encourage all of you to take the trouble to read, which says, the trouble with physics, the rise of string theory, and the fall of a science. Well, he in fact goes on, that is not given here, but he in fact goes on to suggest that the present crisis in physics, which he says is since 1975, nothing really has happened in physics. That is his summary. It's because of string theory, because the best of brains have gone to string theory, and ultimately, well, that's it. So, uh, so, basically we are talking about a different paradigm, a different language, a different mathematics. And from this different mathematics will evolve a different physics and therefore a different interpretation of this physics. What is this different mathematics? It is anti-differential equation because differential equations essentially lead to continuity. It leads to well, smooth problems, uh, basically jumps and uh, uh, things uh, and singularities. Some of the things which traditional physics will try to avoid as much as they can are always uh, differential equations. The evolution of differential equations cannot take care of these things, but these are the things that chaos and complex structures basically depend on. So basically then, what is it that we need? Uh, well, the, the basic point is that reductionism has possibly, well, uh, I should, be, should not be misunderstood, but has possibly reached its end in deliver according to Lee Smolin. It, 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 it probably cannot lead to anything m more. Just as classical physics reached its end at the turn of the last century and quantum mechanics had to steer it around that. So pro probably what we need right now is not reductionism, but holism. And what is holism? Holism is the principle that parts of any whole cannot exist and be understood except in the relation to the whole. And this, by definition, this entirety of things evolving on their own, structures, life, as we experience it. Why are we all here? Second law of thermodynamics would have suggested, and it in fact demands that order should not exist. But then we are examples of order existing, very much so. So what happens? Has the second law been defeated? Has the second law been uh, bro has bro broken down in living systems, in open systems which interact with the environment? Well, the answer is no. And this theory of canopsity or whatever you may call it, which stands is, a, is an acronym of 
chaos, nonlinearity, and complexity essentially tries to suggest how this is possible. Okay, I think I will skip all of this because this is a huge thing which uh, I do not want to go through. But uh, this is, uh, this essentially summarizes the reductionist versus holistic methodology. And uh, as you can see from here that in, in holism, <coughs> what we look at is, uh, is a synthesis, the last one, the synthesis as compared to the analysis. Analysis means you break it down, you reduce it to its parts, and then you study the parts, and then when you have studied the parts as best as you could, put them together, you get the whole. That, that, that is not what happens. That is not what life is all about. Uh, all, of us are, all of us are have approximately some 210 organs, but all of us are different. If it was not so, if there were no holism, if it was all reductionism, then all of us would have been identical. Okay, now again I can get rid of this. And uh, I don't think that because we are going to ultimately spend a good part of our time on looking at uh, looking at uh, the, the issues which are concerned us here in, in this symposium, in this conference, that of entanglement through the eye of this uh, holistic uh, canoxity approach. So then basically what does it try to do? It, 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 is, it deals with different equations. Its, its basic structure is different equation and not differential equation. What is the big difference does it make? It makes all the difference because different equations iterate, it evolves. Uh, at a particular time, it evolves on what was the immediately prior to that. Uh, and this word prior I'm using in the strict mathematical sense, uh, following and preceding and all that sort of thing. So basically, unlike differential equations, if I give you the initial condition now, it will evolve according to that initial condition till whatever time you want it to evolve to without any interaction, basically without any interaction. Whereas this essentially takes into account all the interaction that appears of the system and its environment and thereby basically is, allow, is able to lead to emergence, emergence of, new character, emergence of new properties, which is what this entire thing is about. So again, I think I will, uh, I will uh, skip all this. Now, essentially this theory is not metric space based, it is topology, topological based. Now, what, what is topology here? Topo topology here, essentially, in terms of topologies, uh, which are basically given in the properties P1, P2, P3. And uh, um, what we are basically interested in is the idea of convergence, because evolution is an idea of convergence. The things are evolving. And ultimately, they are uh, showing up in a certain form, which is a result of uh, evolution, which is a result of convergence to a certain uh, well-defined structure. Now, um, in all this, you have to realize that uh, something that has not been mentioned so far, at least I have not heard it in the lectures uh, that we have uh, been hearing, uh, that is uh, the second law of thermodynamics. It is the supreme law, as far as uh, some people would have us believe. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Sir Earth Arthur Eddington uh, had famously said that, well, uh, if you have de devised something, if your theory says that, well, the Maxwell's equations are wrong, then, well, he says, the experimentalists do blunder sometimes. So that could very well be. But then if somebody says that uh, the second law of thermodynamics is wrong, then the only thing that Sir Arthur Eddington could advise is that he will simply disappear in oblivion. Nothing will happen to you. Well, without getting into the semantics of all that, what it essentially implies is that we have to take into account, since we are talking of evolution, since we are talking about how things will ultimately emerge in time, uh, we have to take into account the serious fact of uh, the second law of thermodynamics. Now, second law of thermodynamics tells us that ultimately everything becomes degraded, dissipated. Nothing appears as order. Order gets automatically de degraded, uh, but uh, the dissipated state never on its own gets ordered. So this is the fundamental difference between, uh, uh, between uh, order and disorder, between living structures, which are uh, examples of order, and, and, uh, and the, the dead state of what the second law of thermodynamics would
would have us believe. The question is, how does this have happened? Why is there order in the world? Now, this is part of the complex structure, and this essentially kind of to, this is very important. Uh, it's a multifunctional extension of function spaces. Uh, essentially, all the physics that we do is basically in function spaces. We take care that multiplicities, we take care that uh, we don't have a sine curve standing on uh, its edge like this. We don't have that. I mean, that sort of things essentially is not uh, very uh, well uh, dealt with in physics and in mathematics. We always, al always want a specific uh, well-ordered theorems. We already want specific uh, uniqueness results and so on. Now, multifunctions mean that a point in the input can lead to many outputs. Now, this essentially has the implication, as we shall see, that basically what we're talking about is, in a sense, quantum mechanical. Because quantum mechanical, quantum mechanics, has this uh, wonderful uh, uh, property of a wave. It's not localized. Heisenberg's principle tells you that if you want to lo localize it, it its uh, momentum, its energy will get delocalized. So essentially, uh, spreading out, being omnipresent, is one of the basic properties of quantum mechanical thing, and entanglement is a manifestation of that. Now, when we, have, when we start with multifunctions, it says that there can be many, many outputs of a given input. We are already getting into that sort of argument, but then there is a very, very important and subtle difference, a difference which is the basic difference, which, which will ultimately lead to the basic difference between what I'm saying and, uh, and the uh, entanglements as we have been uh, hearing uh, from the morning. And, and the difference is that this is nonlinear. So basically, this is strong nonlinearity. Therefore, basically, superposition principles do not work here. And once the superposition principles do not work here, then I can have as many um, solutions, etc., uh, and basically choose from any one of them by something known as the axiom of choice in mathematics and get results which will not run into the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. The measurement problem of quantum mechanics is a very fundamental problem. And that leads to all sorts of interpretational problems with uh, quantum mechanics. But then basically, if we want to work with nonlinear systems, strongly nonlinear systems, which essentially are multifunctional, that means it does lead to a basket of possibilities. All that we have to do, measurement, what is measurement in that case? All that we have to do is simply to pick up one of them. And how do I pick it up? Axiom of choice. Whether you believe, if you believe in axiom of choice, use it. If you don't believe in axiom of choice, well, you don't really have much, uh, uh, you, you cannot do much about it. Okay, so this multifunctional, and this space, the multifunctional space has been shown to be essentially an extension of functional space. Uh, so basically then, uh, what we get into is, and let me quickly skip all this. this concept of a negative world. Now, what is this negative world? The negative world is, think of it, without going into the details, uh, uh, think of it as the negative reals and the positive reals. The negative reals are the negative numbers. Now, if the negative reals did not exist, then essentially uh, the real line would be incomplete. Uh, mathematically, it would be incomplete. And you would only increase you would go from four to five, five to six, but you'd never be able to come back to four because the, real, the negative numbers don't exist. So basically, the negative world is a product of, uh, of this sort of an argument that I can define some non-real quantity this. Uh, actually, I have defined uh, a space W which for every W in the real W, let us call this the real numbers, I define something whose union gives me essentially zero, the empty set. Now this never happens in the real case. There's nothing which I can, I, ca I, I cannot have a set and take one element from that set and take another element from another set, take the union and make it in, uh, phi, the empty set. That doesn't happen. But then, just like the reals, I cannot have uh, 4 plus 2 b less than either 4 or 2 unless I take 2 from the negative. So similarly, I define a negative space which is denoted by these uh, script letters and define the union of the real and the non-real as this. 
So this is a perfectly valid assumption, a definition. Now once we accept this definition, then various mathematical techniques can lead to what we call the exclusion space, the exclusion topology, the exclusion space, which basically is a mechanism which is essentially topological uh, um, uh, correspondence of, let us say, the real lines. And the job of this is simply to monitor, to inhibit the growth that would otherwise be there in the, uh, in the, uh, without the negative part. So what is the use of all this? The use of all this is as follows that second law of thermodynamics and the question of how the living systems appear, how they uh, apparently defy the mandate of the second law. This is from the fact that I can always, this exclusion topology and the negative world uh, essentially can be extended and projective limits, etc. But then when I translate all these ideas to the thermodynamically, these two now, if I want to look at it from what we understand materially, essentially becomes a coupling of a pump and an engine. The engine is the stuff which degrades. It is the dissipation, expansion. What we need to have order is a component of compression. And that compression is a pump. How does this happen? This is where complex structures come in. This is automatically generated by the system. Nobody does it. It simply happens on its own. That is where the complex structures come in. That is where emergence comes in. Emergence, nobody, it is not programmed. It happens on its own. So this entire thing uh, essentially can be put in a complete thermodynamic language. Work that you get, the maximum work that you get. The blue is the actual work on, on an uh, non-reversible cycle that you can possibly get and the assumption is that this W is automatically fed back into a loop which, which generates P. This is essentially positive and negative feedback, nothing more, nothing less. But we are now trying to adapt all this to a particular holistic character of how it happens and suggesting that this is how the open thermodynamic systems, in fact, uh, a macroscopic property which has to be explained, which has to, because it is one of the intensive properties, and essentially you have to basically figure out what is the role of temperature in all this. And if I look into all those uh, properties and we go through the details of all those properties, then what we shall find, uh, which is quite different from uh, the traditional things that we do, is that temperature, there can be two temperatures. One is this graph that you see here, and the other is the dotted one that you see here. And this dotted is essentially in the negative temperature regime. These are absolute temperatures. This is the Kelvin temperature. And therefore, having negative temperatures is simply not uh, the rule of the game. You don't have negative temperatures. You don't even have zero temperatures. You cannot get close, even close to it. Uh, and that is where the Bose-Einstein condensation, etc., comes in. So basically, uh, this theory leads to two temperatures. One is the T, the, this is, our real world, this is what happens, and then this is the negative world. And now what is the complex structure? The complex structure is that these two act together. I mean, once they have been generated on their own, they act together and they produce whatever we see. Now, what, what, what does all this have to do with quantum mechanics? Well, the following. Uh, what it has to do with quantum mechanics is that, uh, basically, this part that we see here, let us not go into the detail, is essentially what is chaos, what we call chaos. And this negative temperature zone is not there. I mean, it, it doesn't have a, a physical um, uh, counterpart in the real world, so we will, we will not try to assign any meaning to this. But these two together uh, make up the negative world, the anti-world, uh, as you may call it. And uh, basically, uh, what happens is that the this negative world. Uh, so basically, in these two temperatures, uh, I can now take Tc as a variable, 
keep pH constant. If I keep pH constant, I mean, there are reasons why I'm saying that TC is a variable and pH is a constant. pH is the higher temperature. Think of the higher temperature and the lower temperature and an engine running between the two. Essentially, it's the same sort of thing. But then, basically, now I hold the pH constant, and there are reasons why I'm holding pH constant, and allowing TC to change. If TC changes, that's the lower temperature, so it, it can go uh, uh, how low? At the most zero, because th this is a real temperature. This is, not, uh, this, is, uh, this is not the negative temperature. And how high can it go? It can go, TC can be TH. Why not? Let it go TH and see what happens to the equations. And let it go beyond, uh, in excess of TH, be larger than TH. Then what will happen if you go through the exercise properly, then what you, you will find, they join together. And they form one entire, and this completely form the negative world, and the real world TH goes from zero to infinity. Now obviously they have a boundary. Uh, P equal to zero is the boundary. What happens at that boundary? Well, we have arguments to show that that boundary basically corresponds to the quantum mechanical description as we understand it. And uh, uh, if we do that, then other concepts like the black hole, etc., uh, seem to follow in a natural way without, uh, and most of the paradoxes of quantum mechanics, the interpretational paradoxes of quantum mechanics, uh, for example, the uh, measurement problem which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, this seemed to get resolved. Now, the only thing that I can say is that uh, this paper has essentially gone through a very rigorous sort of scanning by uh, the journal Foundations of Physics, and uh, uh, they were prepared to publish it with certain changes which I did not agree to. So basically, uh, probably what I'm saying is not really Meaningless. Okay, now, uh, what is the distinguishing feature of quantum mechanics as uh, differentiated from classical? Well, this is what we have been talking about since the morning, superposition principle, Hilbert space. Classical mechanics does not require a Hilbert space to, for its foundation, quantum mechanics does. Every ray is a state, and every state is a ray. This is a very strong statement which quantum mechanics makes, and essentially, uh, I believe that most of the problems arise from that. Because if I do take uh, as a assumption or as a hypothesis that the world is nonlinear and not linear, the superposition is no longer a uh, matter of uh, right. We do have a multifunction, therefore there are many, many uh, possible choices. And all that we have to do is to apply the axiom of choice, pick up under the given initial conditions, define a choice function. The choice function, uh, definition of the choice function will reflect your initial conditions. So I define the choice function, which reflects my initial conditions, and I pick up according to that choice function from that basket that the multifunction provides me, and that is my experimental result. So basically then, uh, if I go through this approach, then uh, you will find that most of the quantum mechanical paradoxes seem not to exist. Now I'm sure that if these are examined more carefully by people more qualified than I am, uh, things will change. I expect them to change. But basically, I suppose that there is uh, good ground to sort of take these, this alternative way of looking at things, and at least try to look at it clearly. Okay, now, yeah, now why do I say all this? Because uh, entanglement depends on tensor products. This is the most fundamental thing. And what is a tensor product? Tensor product is when I'm trying to build up a composite from uh, units. So basically, we are talking of here since the morning of spin up and spin down uh, systems. So essentially what we have one is up, one is down. Again, one is positive, one is negative. R plus, R minus. Negative world, real world. So essentially, I can interpret it that way. And if I look at, okay, I'll come back to that later on. But then what is most important here is, is in the tensor product is that if I have uh, two qubits, 
and I want, to in, want them to interact, each one of these qubits has dimension two, so it will be two, not into two, which is equal to four, but two to the power of two, that is equal to four. Now if I have n qubits and interacting, then it is two to the power of n. And this is what gives the quantum computers its magical, um, uh, magical property. That now, classically, we would have, if I do classical st 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 statistical mechanics, then with n bits, I can have uh, only e each in the, in the up and down position, I can have two multiplied by n, not two to the power n. And this makes a huge amount of difference if, if n is suitably large. And this is where the, the, the property of quantum computing essentially lies. Because after all, you're writing down the tensor product of two matrices, a linear construct, as another matrix of power uh, n squared, uh, when we're talking of two. Uh, I mean, n, n such uh, matrices being put together, spin down. Now, this is the qubit. So essentially now, why is this a qubit and not a classical bit, two classical bits? Well, simply because if I take an output here, I do always get two values. This, this, is, the, this is the multifunction. So essentially, one output gives rise to more than one input. Uh, that is basically the property that we are trying to use here. And then, <coughs> since this is a function, then what we do, we take it as uh, equation fx is equal to lambda x in on one minus x and iterate. What does iteration mean? Evolution in time. But this is an ev evolution in time, not as a differential equation, but then uh, if this is f1 or if this is f, th then the next one is I replace this x by the previous f. Then in the next time evolution, I replace this x by f, fx. So that becomes f3x. So basically then, at each instant of time, it, it is depending on immediate predecessor. This is what brings about the fundamental change in the properties. And this fundamental change uh, is shown here in these diagrams. Depending on the value of lambda, this qubit, let me use that language, if iterated to infinite time, that means allowed to evolve infinitely, will give rise to this, uh, the horizontal, I mean this structure that you see here. Uh, this structure that you see here. Uh, this complete structure, one, two, three, four, and this entire thing that you see here. Uh, and this structure with lambda is sufficiently large. And this structure is lambda is different. And this is essentially what happens in this sort of game. Uh, this is the equivalent of the entangled states, okay? Because in, now in this particular case, uh, if I look at this as the two qubit entangled state, then uh, what you have is that the ultimate object here, the ultimate object here or the ultimate object there, <coughs> basically is an entity in itself. And this is a complex structure, this is a complex evolved structure. You cannot, by definition, remove any one of the constituent, uh, constituents of that uh, complex structure. And what are those constituents? The constituents here are these points which are marked with solid dots. These are the unstable points, unstable fixed points of the entire process of iteration. These correspond to, this, this, you see this is, a, I, I can see here one, two, three, and four, a four-tiered structure. Here I can see one and two, two-tiered structure. So this is two to the power one, this is two to the power two, this is essentially two to the power infinity, what happened? This is full chaos. Oh no, uh, yeah, this is full chaos. This is uh, at 3.57, you get into the region of full chaos. Now. Uh, the basic point is that this is my macrostructure, this is my macrostructure, and these four unstable uh, fixed points, these two unstable fixed points, they are the microstructure. So essentially now I'm trying to correlate the Boltzmann entropy relation, S is equal to K log W. So what is the, in this particular case, what is W? What is the number of microstates? There are four, one, two, three, four. And what is the macrostate? This entire structure that you see here. I cannot remove any one of these uh, fixed points without the entire system collapsing, without the entire um, uh, complex structure which has been developed collapsing. Now witness this uh, to partial tracing in, in uh, the theory of entanglement. You do get significant information, in fact all the information, uh, by partially tracing over one of, the, um, uh, one of the variables. So basically, and that is a valid way of doing things. But now here in this particular case, you just cannot do that because if you try to remove any one of these particles, then the entire structure is going to collapse. It, 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 
uh, complex structures do not allow that freedom. Obviously, that is also up. So that is how the entire thing goes. Uh, now, decomposition. And the Smith decomposition guarantees that such an entangled state can be in which the entanglement is expressed so in, in our basic state. And from this, we get into the mixed state which was from which we are getting the individual S is one, uh, one qubit, E is the other. So we put them together and get this SE. Uh, but then by partial tracing, we recover uh, each one of these, um, uh, each one of them separately. And uh, for one, one, one important part is that this index R remains the same in both cases. So basically, this is forbidden by what I have just described. So uh, in, in the way that we want to argue, uh, complex non-locality is a much stronger form of entanglement than quantum non-locality. Complex holism, let me put it that way. What we have just described is complex holism. Complex holism is a much stronger form of entanglement than quantum non-locality. And this can have serious repercussions on quantum computing as we understand it. Because uh, decoherence is, I think, please correct me if I'm wrong, the experts in this field. Uh, decoherence, I think, is one of the most troubling factors of quantum computing. Because with decoherence, uh, the, the, the entanglements get destroyed, and thereby the power of p to the power n gets destroyed. Uh, so essentially, uh, but such a thing, as I said, since it cannot happen here, um, should not be a problem if this is what is happening uh, as uh, compared to um, the... Uh, Professor Sengupta, uh, sorry to interfere, but I think for the benefit of the students, at least, it would be nice if you could kindly tell what, uh, like, you know, in case of sh quantum mechanics, we typically solve Schrodinger's equation or the nonlinear form of the Schrodinger equation. Or we go and solve linear algebra in terms of doing density matrix evolutions, which are Liouville forms of the differential equations. What is the exact mathematical form or the model that you are solving? If you could kindly tell that to the students, it will be really helpful. What is the mathematical form of the model? I do not think we are considering any model here. This is a very general prescription. Uh, so we are not considering any model whatsoever. W all that we are trying to say is that if an open thermodynamic system has to exist thermodynamically, that means in defiance of the, what the second law tries to tell us, then this is how it happens. And these structures that I have shown, which I was trying to get to, uh, these structures that we have shown, uh, they are this engine and the pump, this uh, negative world and the positive world. They get together and produce this thing. Uh, okay, now to, to answer your question, uh, maybe I can... Uh, okay, I, I was trying to get to this. Now you see this entire... This entire... Uh, these two that I said is uh, the producer is responsible for the negative world. And this is the positive, the, the world that we are in. Uh, these can ultimately be used very judiciously. Uh, in fact, example four of the paper that you uh, mentioned uh, to understand ferromagnetic and paramagnetic. Uh, and uh, basically, let me get to that example four. This is the picture that we have here is essentially obtained by considering the we consider a two-state paramagnet that means up and down paramagnet uh, of n elementary up down magnets dipoles in a magnetic field B in the plus z direction. Then these expressions are well known. This E, for example, is energy. 
Now once this energy is known, then I can use the standard equation for uh, of thermodynamics and basically obtain this graph of, of the specific heat, this graph of the temperature which has a discontinuity at energy equal to zero. The negative energies are the uh, 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 bound state, this positive energy are the non-bound state. And I can have a uh, expression, uh, a, a diagram for the entropy also. Now the entropy I, I, it plays a very significant role. In fact, what happens is that if I look into the ferromagnet, para paramagnet uh, transition, then this is supposed to happen at the critical temperature uh, by a second order phase transition, basically. Now, uh, how does this happen in this particular case? I'm not very clear about that. But basically, I do think that such a thing is taking place that such a thing is taking place, I'm trying to work on it right now as to how the second order phase transition comes in. But a very important role is played by the T equal to zero temperature. That's a very, very important thing. In fact, the T equal to zero temperature, it is non-accessible because I think because it is a boundary between the real world and the negative world. And this is the place where, uh, which is, the domain uh, of quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics, as I have tried to say somewhere in, somewhere in this paper, is a linear representation of a fully chaotic state. So, I mean, uh, other than that, I think it is very difficult for me now to explain to you uh, if you, you, you do not have time to actually go through the details of these uh, discussions. Okay, I think uh, I will stop here, and if you have any further questions, if you want me to elucidate something, that will be my. The paper is now open for discussion on the floor. You see, this particular figure, uh, if you open up any book on chaos theory, you will find this figure, this figure, and without all this, you will find it uh, in any book of uh, chaos theory. And this is supposed to be the period doubling by partition. So now here I can, in my paradigm, I can look at this as a spin up, spin back down. Then this is, from this, another, those black dots that I have shown on the diagram, uh, these are those points, these are those points. So again, there is one spin up, one spin down, one spin up, one spin down, and ultimately, when you get to this parameter lambda, remember I showed you a lot of diagrams, different lambda values. So at this lambda star, it gets into the chaotic region. Now that is what you will find in any book. Now these li few lines here are basically according to what we are talking about. And this T alpha iota, this iota is the irreversibility constant which I had shown, and this T is the temperature. So basically what happens, because through equivalence classes, which is very important here, equivalence classes generated by the multifunctional uh, mapping. Uh, basically what happens is that the temperature T equal to plus infinity and T equal to minus infinity get mapped onto each other. We can think of putting them round, okay? So plus infinity, R plus, R minus, putting them round and making them meet. So that is what happens. T equal to plus infinity is equal to minus infinity. That is how this T equal to plus minus infinity appears. Now this thing that you see here is essentially this entire region. And what I have stated is that this region is the quantum mechanical region. Now, why do I say that? Because I do have uh, something, power laws. Uh, you know, uh, power laws, the uh, Ziff's law, and uh, uh, these are very, very standard things that one talks about in uh, all these things. You, you, you try to see whether a particular law, a particular theory which you are describing can be described by something like x to the power n. Uh, n is not an integer, that is the fractal dimension and so on and so forth. So if that is possible, uh, in this case we show that it, that is indeed possible, then this thing, uh, in this region, what happens is that uh, that n, let us say, uh, starts increasing from zero to one here, at this point where it becomes entirely chaotic, and then as it crosses, it drops to zero. There's a sudden jump from zero, uh, from one, which is, which is uh, 
get clearer to zero just as it crosses. Lambda star minus the parameter chi, that is the end that I was talking about, is one uh, at lambda star plus the value of chi is zero. Now, whenever there is such a jump in some physical parameter that signals uh, the birth of some new unexpected characteristic. And what happens is that in this entire uh, region of chaotic region, which are these lines, these are windows, let us not get into the details of that. In this entire region, the value of chi remains zero. It does not change. And then as it goes beyond four, it suddenly becomes one again. So now by equivalence argument, I can say that this zero entirely is equivalent to these zeros here. So now when something, uh, you see what happened is, if I again get back, fx is equal to x to the power chi, let us suppose. And then it, as the chi value is increasing, then it is, uh, if uh, chi is equal to one, it is linear. If chi is less than one, but more than zero, then it is nonlinear. As it is approaching zero, then it is the most nonlinear. Okay, it gets into a multifunction. So basically, if this is zero, then, and it is chaos, then it means that basically fx is equal to x, linear. So that is one of the reasons why we say that uh, quantum mechanics is a linear representation of the fully chaotic state. Because this parameter value of chi, which represents the uh, power to which you must effectively represent the entire system you know, as a complex structure becomes zero in that region. And because it is multifunctional, because in this particular case, it is, uh, uh, well, I, I will not get back to that. In this region, if I look at those maps, then it, it will, you think of sine kx as k goes to infinity. What happens? You get infinite number of lines spaced together. So that is what happens in this particular case as we cross lambda equal to lambda star. Uh, so it is infinitely multifunctional. So it is, uh, I mean, quantum mechanically, it, it is almost like a wave, let us say. But then it is not a wave because it's not a or, or solution of a second order equation. But basically it has a power which is zero, which is linear, effectively linear. And then it is spreading everywhere. Because I take one point in sine kx going to infinity on the y-axis, I get infinite number of points. So this is how we conclude that quantum mechanics is an effective representation, not an approximation, I again repeat, of the fully chaotic state.